Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to get started now. Um, I'm Stephanie. I work at uh, the National Center for Electron Microscopy, which is part of the Molecular Foundry at Berkeley Lab, and I'm here with Tirza. Um, Tirza, if you want to go ahead. Sure. I'm uh, Tirza Abbott, and I'm the SEM manager at the Nuance Center here at Northwestern University, and I'm a second-year PhD student in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department. So welcome to the fourth annual Women in Microscopy virtual conference, an event hosted by the Nuance Center here at Northwestern and the Microscopy Society of America's Student Council. This conference was started to celebrate the contributions of women in the field of microscopy and have open discussions about key issues that people face across STEM fields. Like past years, we have a very exciting agenda today, including a keynote and some research talks spanning biological and physical sciences, as well as panel discussions on imposter syndrome, how to be an ally and navigating your career. This year, we would like to welcome and thank our collaborators, including the Union of Concerned Scientists and the MSA DEI Committee, who have worked with us to organize these thoughtful and very important panel discussions. And I'll send it back to Stephanie. Okay, um, so we, we wanted to say that over the past four years, this event has blossomed into a really vibrant community that far exceeded our initial expectations. Um, you may notice that the timing of this event coincides with Women's History Month and International Women's Day, but the issues that we're discussing today, we think really should be considered year round. And similarly to that point, um, today we celebrate not only women, but really try and embrace all forms of diversity, hoping that perhaps we can inspire other groups and also in turn really hope to be inspired from them. So we, we strongly encourage you to engage with our community and reach out to um, other attendees, the speakers, student council members, people from Nuance, and discuss new ideas, ask questions, and form connections. And along those same lines, um, we'll be keeping a close eye on the Q&A section throughout the day. So if you have any questions for any of the speakers, um, please put them there. Um, so with that now, I'd like to introduce Andreas Marcus, who's going to tell us about the student council. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. My name is Andres Marquez. I'm a researcher at Oak Ridge National Lab, and I'm a master's student at the University of Tennessee. I also happen to be this year's president for the MSA Student Council. MSA Student Council is a society by students for students. We have expanded our workflow to include postdocs since they are an obvious addition to the team and they're an intermediary between us and professionals. So they open up an opportunity to guide us and mentor us through things. The Student Council does a um, a large amount of activities through the year. We try to assist to as many local affiliated society, conferences, workshops. We host social events. We do some things like we're doing right now with the Women in Microscopy with the Nuance Center. We have activities with the international microscopy community. And our big culmination is right before M&M, we host a pre-meeting Congress for students, uh, postdocs, and early career professionals, where we have two-day events of social events with an open bar a whole scientific day of uh, talks and discussions and poster sessions, followed by an evening banquet that is included for any registrants. We offer a variety of opportunities, uh, funding for students to go to conferences and workshops. We have um, poster session winners. We have prize winners during the year. So we're very engaging with our local community and the national and international community. I would encourage all of you all to go to microscopy.org, find the member section and look for the student section. You can find a little bit more information on who we are, what we do, and if you are interested at all to joining or have any questions, send us an email. Everything is in that webpage and we will gladly uh, answer any questions and hopefully engage with you all through the year. Thank you, Steph. All right, and uh, to introduce Nuance, well, I'd like to introduce Professor Vinayak Dravid. Okay. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> I just wanted to add my personal welcome, uh, but also on behalf of the Nuance family for hosting this event. It's an incredible event. I recall what started as a modest outreach event a few years ago has now ballooned into this an amazing program. So my compliments and kudos to the organizer for all their tremendous work uh, to get to this level. It's just incredible to see the field of microscopy growing and we need all the, the tent to be as big as it can be. And this is one of our uh, out, main outreach events as a part of the Nuance Center. So I encourage you to check out Nuance Center so you can see what we do. 
And with that, I'm going to uh, pass it on the baton to Aubrey, I believe. And uh, Aubrey has been part of this uh, right from the beginning. So take it away, Aubrey. Um, unfortunately, I think Aubrey is having some technical difficulties. So take it, it is away, Stephanie. my great pleasure then to introduce okay. Professor Nargales, who's our keynote speaker. And um, we're really, really excited that you can join us today. Um, so briefly, Professor Nogales is a Howard Hughes Medical, Invest Medical Institute investigator, a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of California, Berkeley, and senior faculty science at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. She obtained her BS degree in physics from the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid in Spain. She did her work at the synchrotron radiation source in the UK under the supervision of Joan Bordas on the structural dynamics of tubulin assembly earning a PhD from the University of Keeley. Her work in Kenneth Downing's group at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory involved the use of electron crystallography to determine the high resolution structure of tubulin. Um, so Professor Nagales, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen. Um... Thank you, Stephanie. Um, let me know if you guys can see this. Hold on a second, is that right? Looks great. That looks great. Okay. Perfect. So what I would like to start by doing is first, um, just congratulating the organizers. I'm just so very impressed by how you guys have put together the event, the reach of the event, seeing uh, people joining from anywhere from South America to Europe, as well as all over the United States. It's very impressive. So congrats. Also, congratulations to all women. It's our day, so <laughs> enjoy it. Do something special for yourself. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, I I now only now realize that the audience will be very broad, scientifically speaking, and I could have done something that is maybe more appropriate for a mixture of biologists and physicists. Um, but this is going to be kind of heavy, um, very much on the biology and the molecular details. Um, my lab uses Quarian to basically visualize macromolecules in the process of doing what they do and um, believing that seeing is, uh, is believing. And we have applied this to a number of systems. And today I'm going to be telling you about one system that controls what genes uh, are expressed in, in any given cell type. But before that, first of all, just let I just want the organizers to uh, stop me with plenty of time for questions. Um, it doesn't matter if I don't get to the end, I would rather go a little bit more slowly and then have time for questions. I don't have to cover everything that is in my slide. But just as a way of introduction, they told me I should say something about myself. So I come from a small town north of Madrid near the mountains. It's called Colmenar Viejo, which translates for something like uh, old beehive. Um, my parents were children during um, the post-Civil uh, War in Spain. They couldn't even go to high school. They were very obsessed with uh, my brother and I going to uh, to college and being white-collar workers, if you want, and knowledgeable and all so far. Um, in Spain then, but even, uh, even today, you went to the university that was closer to your parents' house and you live with your parents through the whole process. Uh, in my case, I went to the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, which was fairly new at the time and built next to a military post so that the students could kept under control during the Franco um, years, during the dictatorship. But of course, by the time I went there, we were already a democracy. I studied physics influenced a lot by my physics teacher uh, in high school, who was a woman. Um, Ana Cañas, my math teacher, who was also a, a woman, Avelina Lucas, and my uh, biology teacher was also very um, influential in me. And I want to say that she contributed to my switching to biology at a given time, Ana, Ana um, de Frutos. So um, although I had to study near my parents, I decided that for my PhD, I wanted to break free and, uh, and, and go somewhere else. And this was to start with a little shocking because I have never been out of Spain and suddenly I was there by myself. But I did go to England where I 
studied uh, under the supervision of someone that had also moved from physics to biology, Joan Bordas. It, it, it sounds like a female name, but he is a man. Um, um, and I went to a synchrotron, one of the original first generation synchrotrons, um, where I used uh, a small angle X-ray scattering to start looking at the assembly of tubulin. And as an aside, in a kind of pseudo uh, quantitative way, I was I started to use cryo-electron microscopy. And this was late 80s, beginning of the 1990s, where cryo-EM was still uh, um, a starting budding technique. Uh, then I went big time across to um, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to do my postdoc uh, um, in, in biophysics. I, um, I moved with my boyfriend, now husband, who actually worked at the advanced light source, so another synchrotron, as you can see here. Um, but I really moved to do uh, electron microscopy, in particular cryo, uh, um, sorry, electron diffraction with Ken Downing, who is shown here together with um, Sharon Wolf in 1997, when we were uh, so much younger as postdocs. This was the stent of our lab. We were three people, just one PI and two postdocs. Um, and it went very well. We were able to obtain the atomic structure of tubulin on what was the third uh, structure to, to be obtained by this technique. And this landed me uh, an assistant professorship position at the Molecular Cell Biology Department in UC Berkeley. And a couple of years later, I became a Howard Hughes investigator, uh, which really has been uh, very important for my career. Within Berkeley, I have been able to collaborate with amazing people, and these have really shaped my career and what I do. I just want to mention one, because uh, I love this picture. When we were very young, our kids, uh, my younger and, and, and Jennifer's kids were seven. They used to be babysit, babysitted by the same babysitter when they were babies. At the time, um, we were already collaborating on things before uh, CRISPR, but uh, of course, she's one of my major collaborators. We continue to collaborate till this day. And this is my introduction. Um, I worked on my lab works on a number of things with two major things, microtubules and gene expression regulation. And this is what I'm going to be telling you about in the context of our studies of polycon repressive complex 2 or PRC2. Now, this is a complex that uh, does one thing and is modify a lysine in a particular histone uh, within the nucleosomes that condense our, our chromosomes for, for the physicists. Um, this is like painting or giving a special properties to uh, chromosomes. In this particular case, establishing doing the chemistry that adds three methyl groups to this particular lysine, K27, in histone H H3, so acting as a writer of this modification, this is what is done by the subunit ECH2 within the complex, is going to end up ultimately silencing the gene. Now, within the co this core complex, there is another subunit, ED, that I will also be mentioning a lot because this is a reader of that modification. So this subunit is able to bind to the modified lysine and in the process, allosterically activate um, the methyltransferase domain of ECH2. And this is thought to be very important for the spreading of this modification so that entire regions of the genome get modified and silenced. They cannot be read. This is very important um, during development to establish cell identity. All our cells have the same genome, but each cell is different, whether it's heart, skin, bone, because a big chunk of the genome has been selectively silent. In any case, this complex is also important, not just during embryogenesis, but also during the life of the organism. And when it's misregulated, it gives rise to cancer. So it's a major cancer target. The complex always acts uh, with additional protein cofactor that give the complex different flavors. So that it comes mostly, mostly on two types, the PRC 2.1, and the PRC 2.2, which is the one that we've studied the most. And this brings in two other subunits, Jarrett 2 and ABP2, that activates the complex in a number of ways. But the complex is also regulated by other histone modifications. So what are the states of these histone tails that the complex engages 
is going to affect whether it is active or not. So when the complex is active, this modification express, uh, spreads, chromatin is compacted, and those genes are silenced. If the complex is inhibited, then uh, without that modification, chromatin can be open and transcription can occur. So we started studying this uh, many years ago before the resolution revolution in CRAO-EM, and um, Claudio actually used negative stain and very clever tricks of molecular biology to actually define the um, subunit organization of the human complex. And one of the things that he found is that the top lobe actually contains the minimal number of elements that are required both to give, uh, to methylate K27 and also read the methylation and allosterically activate. And a few years later, some crystallographic structures, very beautiful, based in first in fungi and then in human, showed how that regulation occurs. This is very cool. So what happens is that the activated peptide, so the peptide that has already been trimethylated, binds to the ED subunit, shown in cyan, and in the process, it stabilizes what is called a stimulatory response motif, or SRM. This is a region of the protein shown in yellow that is normally unfolded, but it folds onto a helix on top of the peptide. And in the process of doing that, it interacts with some uh, elements in the set domain, the methyl transferase domain, putting it, placing it in a right conformation to do the modification. But just remember, this SRM helix is only folded when the process is activated through interacting with this already modified peptide. So um, in order for uh, us to obtain a CRAO-EM structure, we have to overcome the fact that this complex is very unstable during sample preparation. And Vignesh, was he was in the lab, he had to use both cross-linking and a carbon support to try to um, make the complex more robust and away from the air-water interface. At the end, he was able to generate a whole a structure of the complex, the, this uh, um, PRC 2.2 with the two cofactors, and actually found that Jarrett 2, which itself is methylated by, um, by ABP2, just like it, it had been uh, shown biochemically, is able to bind to the allosteric site and structurally, we could see how it stabilizes the SRM and give rise to the right conformation of the methyl transferase. Um, so Simon, at the time, um, decided that what he wanted to concentrate on was looking at how the complex binds to chromatin, the natural substrate. But he went a little beyond. He was very brave. He decided to look at a boundary condition where one nucleosome that is unmodified is next to one that is already trimethylated. And the idea is, could he see it bound so that both of them are engaged, one activating and the other one being um, methylated? So he was able to see it, to do it. Unfortunately, the conditions, he could not use cross-linking or carbon support because it was not compatible with obtaining the structure. So in the process, part of the complex uh, blew up, but the part that interacts with the nucleosomes was perfectly stable. He was able to see how the complex bind to both of these um, nucleosomes using uh, the DNA, so using positively charged surfaces on the protein interacting with the negatively charged phosphate backbone of the DNA. And he was most importantly able to show how the trimethylated histone tail from the pre already modified nucleosome is able to bind into the allosteric site and stabilize the SRM helix. The resolution here was not very high because of the flexibility of the complex, but was enough that we could see use docking of available structures and see the presence or absence of these structural elements. The most important thing, as I said, is this was the first time that the complex was being seen bound to nucleosomes, and he described how these positively charged surfaces are able to bind to the nucleosomal DNA. Something very interesting is that he saw a density that could not be explained by available crystal or crystal uh, or structures. And this was very critically placed 
next to the nucleosomal DNA and the histone tail. And most importantly, very close to a particular lysine in that histone tail, which is itself modified by other complexes and um, that can affect the activity of the complex that I may be able to get to uh, later on if, if I have time. Now, um, so our studies have shown, shown us how um, the, the structure um, the can initiate um, through methylation of cofactors. So these um, that themselves can be localized in certain regions of the genome by some means. So I just told you that the JARET2 um, um, can be trimethylated. And what I didn't tell you yet is that JARET2 uh, was already known to actually recognize another modification in chromatin. This is one that is imparted by the polycon repressive complex one, which is able to ubiquitinate, so it's another type of um, modification, a different lysine in a different histone. And the complex is able to recognize it and then, of course, methylate the K27, which is its job. And as I told you, then that methylation. Uh, via um, interaction with two nucleosomes can keep activating the complex. Um, so to, to a study um, the complex bound to nucleosomes, we decided that we wanted to use a method that will preserve well the structure. And Simon Abdiknesh uh, utilized the um, streptamine monolayer affinity grid that had been developed by Bob Glaser at, the, uh, at LBNL. And the idea is to have um, a monolayer of biotinylated lipids to which we combine a streptamine, which bind with high affinity, give it the chance to crystallize in 2D, and now apply our samples biotinylated to that streptamine. Um, and, and this involves both nucleosome that is biotinylated and the PRC2 complex that combine to it. We can incubate, wash the excess, and this blood where we are enriching for now PRC2 complexes that are bound to the nucleosome and hopefully through this attachment, keeping them away from the air-water interface that destroys them. Um, the use of that two-dimensional crystal is because, of course, the Fourier transform of those images will have Bragg reflections corresponding to the streptabidin that then we can computationally remove. And when we Fourier transform back, we now obtain uh, images uh, that just concentrate on the sample that we want to study. This uh, worked uh, very well um, uh, on, on this complex. Again, JAR2 was present, so it's able to activate, and you see a very clear stabilized SRM. And here, Dikinesh was able to show how JAR2 in magenta bind to one ubiquitin shown in orange, where a, while ABP2, the other cofactor, binds to the other ubiquitin in this symmetrical uh, nucleosome. Um, this is structure also shows us that that element that before we we have Simon had seen binding to the substrate nucleosome, and um, that we could not explain by any of the previous structures, corresponded to what we call the bridge helix. This is a helix that sits in this very critical state um, place between the nucleosome, the histone tail as it's going into the active site, and the and the set domain. And um, again, this is another element. This is the second element that is unfolded unless it's in the right um, context. In this, this case, it is bound, uh, the context is bound to the nucleosome, folding against the positive, uh, the negative charge of the, of the nucleosomal DNA. So methylating of cofactors had been established as a way of starting the process of, um, of methylation of K27 that then could spread. But we now propose that another method is automethylation of PRC2. So uh, a number of studies had um, by uh, Tom Cech and Danny Reinberg had shown that um, ECH2 can automethylate, had, can add these methyl groups to itself. Our structures show that those lysines that get methylated are in that bridge helix. Remember when that bridge helix is not bound to the nucleosome like we see here, is unfolded, in which case 
these residues can reach directly into the active site and be very readily um, methylated, okay? This is because uh, that helix is normally unfolded. Okay, so we decided, uh, Simon and Paul, when they were in the lab, that they were gonna see how um, PRC2 bound to nucleosome and what kind of conformation and activity uh, it had when there was no Jarrett 2 no methylated K27 for a, from a nearby nucleosome, when the only source of methylated peptide was ECH2 itself. And what they got was the structure of a complex where not only the, uh, where we have two PRC2s, okay? So there's one, um, this is now, sorry, this is shown twice. So here you go, sorry. Um, I meant to remove the other slide. In any case, so two PRC2s engage with the nucleosome in this case. This is totally dependent on uh, methylation of PRC2. And what happens is one proximal PRC2, which is the one that is engaging the nucleosome, the tail that has the folded bridge helix, uh, recruits a second PRC2 that we call distal that binds to it and the nucleosome and the, and the linker DNA. This is very flexible and it was very hard to push the structure. Just let me tell you that for the aficionado that what was best for us was 3D flex analysis in which Paul used three bodies and five nodes. This is just to show you between the gray and the yellow, the range of motion that is seen in the linker DNA and therefore in the distal uh, PRC2. At the end, working with these three bodies, we were able to push the resolution um, to different extent to the point that we could actually generate a model for the whole assembly. Um, if I turn things around a little bit so that you can get them uh, in the orientation that I've been showing you so far, and then I open this, these two interacting PRC2s like a book. Um, what I'm marking here are on what the circles mark the regions of interactions with DNA. Um, and what you see with the asterisk are regions in which, in the in the red case, um, the mm, the ECH2 in one complex comes in close proximity to the EED in the other, and then there is a second contact which is between SUS12 subunit different regions in the two uh, PRC2s. In our in our analysis, there were two sets of uh, complexes, where the one that I just showed you that has, this is just shown in two different orientations, but is is what I've been telling you before, two PRC2s engage with the nucleosomes, as well as just one PRC2 engage with it. And we can compare the conformational state of all of these now. So we can compare what the conformational state of the proximal PRC2 is with the distal PRC2 in this dimer, as well as what happens when we just have a single complex bound to the nucleosome. And what I want to show you is that, of course, in the two cases where the complex is seen bound to the nucleosome, this bridge helix is very easily seen. It has been stabilized, it's folded, but not in the case of the distal PX2, which is far away from the nucleosomal DNA, okay? Most interestingly, if we look at this allosteric side, we see density bound to the region that normally binds methylated peptide. We see a stabilized SRM for the proximal PRC2, but not in the other two cases. What this is telling us is that of all of these PRC2s, all of them in identical biochemical state, just because of the context, one is stimulated and it will very readily modify um, the, the histone tail and the other two are unstimulated. And it is stimulated by, because in the process of the two complexes coming together, this unstructured bridge helix with, the unfolded helix with the methylated peptides is able to reach into the allosteric side of the other complex. Um, therefore, using the same mechanism, but now one complex acts as the activated one that is gonna do the modification and the other one is uses is acting as an allosteric effector, okay? So our model, now this is really down to the biology, is that 
the initiation of these regions of compacted chromatin comes from first doing the first modifications on the nucleosome of the histone tail by using each other's, using the activation into the into an of an automethylated PRC2 to uh, to initiate that process. Um, this will be very highly dependent on concentration of PRC2 because you have to form a dimer, okay? But once uh, enough of the nucleosomes have been modified, the spreading can occur in the way that Sandman showed with the dinucleosome. This is much more effective, both as, uh, from the point of the geometry, but also now 100% of the PRC2 can act um, doing the job of modifying the nucleosomes. So this is at a point where I could stop. I don't know how long I've been going through or I could continue. Um, so just let me know. Can someone tell me? Organizers? Did I you have more time if you wanna keep going. Um, we can start how much more? Q &A. How much? Uh, 16 or 17 minutes. Excellent, excellent. So let me tell you. Uh, I told you how to initiate and how the spreading then will occur. So my question is, how would PRC2 be stopped? How can it, PRC2 not stop him from just modifying all these nucleosomes through the entire genome and silence the entire genome? And this comes back to the idea that pre-existing modifications could have an effect on how PRC2 is active on those nucleosomes. So it turns up that other complexes do other modifications. In particular, there are complexes that trimethylate lysine 4 in the histone H3 or lysine 36 in the same histone. And these are modifications that indicate regions of active transcription. So one of them is enriching promoters, which is where the polymerase is recruited, and the other one through the gene body as uh, the regions where the polymerase is reading through. So um, our lab and, and others even before us had shown that these modifications, when they pre-exist in the nucleosome, inhibit the complex from methylating the K27. And that means, uh, and this is something by the way, that is somehow this inhibition is somehow weakened by the presence of Jarrett 2, which I show you is an activator because it can add as an allosteric activator of the complex. But in any case, these pre-existing modifications will stop PRC2 because when PRC2 gets to them, uh, the complex is inhibited and it cannot continue the spreading. But how do they work? How can they stop the activity of this complex? So what I'm showing you here, are the structure of some schematics of the complex engaged with nucleosomes, where um, the, the, the complex can be just the core subunit, or it can include the Jarrett 2 that is methylated, and where the complex can be engaging with na engaged with naive and modified nucleosome, or with, um, as you will see in a, in a minute, with nucleosomes that already have some pre existing modifications. And this is put on a scale of activity, okay? So the complex by itself in a modified nucleosome just has some low activity that we call basal activity. If Jarrett 2 with this method that gets trimethylated is present uh, there and it binds to the allosteric side, it increases dramatically the activity, okay? The complex is now allosterically activated and can very readily um, trimethylate K27. Um, this is even a little better when the nucleosome is ubiquitinated because PRC2 will be um, concentrated, it will be binding to those nucleosomes. But what I'm telling you is that the complex, when it tries to act on nucleosomes that have these pre-existing modifications in other regions in the histone tail, is very dramatically inhibited. And in the presence of Jarrett 2, biochemistry had shown, shown us that it has that kind of intermediate between are uh, basal and activated. So our questions, the question that Trinity wanted to answer is what happens in those cases? What is the basis uh, for that inhibition, okay? So I'm gonna tell you, uh, she has really looked at all of these possibilities, all of these combinations. I'm gonna tell you about two of them. The first one is what happened 
when at this kind of intermediate state of activity, when PRC2 with the activating Jared 2 binds to an inhibitory nucleosome. Okay. And I told you about K27 very, very quickly, so maybe most of you will not remember. K36 is right there, is on the tail, right on the path from the nucleosome into the active site. And in fact, that lysine contributes to the exability of this engagement by engaging both with the rest of the, of the complex as um, engaging with PRC2 complex, as well as fixing its, its position with respect to the uh, nucleosomal DNA through these, um, through these interactions. So it's very obvious that you add three methyl groups, so you eliminate the charge, and then you have a bulkier side chain, this is incompatible. So there was already the idea, seeing as structures like this, that this will be inhibitory because the tail will not engage very, will be pro have problems engaging normally. And this is what, um, what Trinity sees. Um, she sees that in, the, in this combination of complex and substrate nucleosome, there is an equilibrium. We see two different stages. One in which the complex looks like what I've been showing you so far with the tail engage into the active site and one in which the tail is not engaged. Okay, so this reflects, you know, this, the, the fact that this equilibrium exists reflect an unstable tail engagement. When the tail is seen, it has changed slightly its conformation so that now this trimethylated lysine is pointing in a different direction and it can be accommodated. But obviously, this is not a very stable uh, binding now. And that's why we have this equilibrium between the two states. Now, when Trinity superimposes these two complexes on the nucleosome, she sees that the PRC2 is binding differently to the nucleosome in the tail engage versus tail disengage. And, you know, elements like the bridge helix that has this a surface of positive charge, a slide, you know, from the blue to the gray with respect to the nucleosome going from the engage to the disengage. Uh, maintaining electrostatic contact, but now being in a different register, if you want, putting the complex in a different register with respect to the nucleosomal DNA. This is shown here in this morph, moving from what she sees in the case of the tail engaged and the ca case of the tail disengaged. This is shows us that the complex is happy to bind anywhere in the nucleosome. And it's only when a tail engages that it fixes its position what is doing the methylation. So these studies showed that tail is very uh, is unstably engaged. In fact, when Jared 2 is not there to put the complex in the right active conformation, PRC2 is moving so much around the nucleosome that we can hardly see it is a blur. But what about K4? The K4 is at the very end terminal end of the of the histone tail is in a place where we don't even see because it's not engaged with protein. <laughs> so how can this be inhibiting the complex? So, so this is what uh, Trinity sees in the case of this really inactivated state where there's no Jarrett 2, okay? Um, and because there's no Jarrett 2, we, she doesn't see the density of Jarrett 2 binding. She sees no SRM. But when she looked in detail, she saw there was a density there. And the density actually corresponds to the end of the tail um, that has the methylated K4 engaging with that um, allosteric side. If you compare what happens in the case of an allosteric side that is bound to Jarrett 2 and one that is bound to the K4 trimethylation, one has the stabilized ECH2, the other one doesn't. So although the, uh, this piece of the tail is, by, is occupying the allosteric side, it's actually not allosterically activating. Um, and this is because if you superimpose now the two structures, um, if you, and you see where the, the, this trimethylated K4 tail binds with respect to the Jarrett 2, the binding is much smaller. Okay, so there's an entire region that is missing and that is important for the stabilization of the SRM. But even there are residues that are hysterically cla crashing, uh, clashing against 
uh, the SRM. So the, as a result, what is happening is that the K4 is acting as an uh, allosteric antagonist. And that gives us a completely different mechanism. So one uh, of these inhibitory um, uh, modifications on the substrate nucleosome acts by just blocking the normal activation, while the other one is blocking the engagement of the tail. So the complex can be activated, but most of the time is not able to grab onto the tail and give it the trimethylated state uh, on K27. So I did manage to go through the whole thing. Apologies for the non-biology, so those that are not in interested in epigenetics, but I hope this gives you an idea of the kind of mechanistic details that now we can deal with using cryo-electron microscopy, even when our structures are very complex mixtures, both biochemical and compositionally, this is, is the case. I think I mentioned everybody as I was going along, except maybe our fantastic undergraduates that work with, with uh, members of my life, like lab, like Jennifer and Curtis that work with Dignesh, or uh, Alex that worked with Trinity, and otherwise NIH and HHMI for funding us over the years, and you guys for uh, listening to it. And I would love to have questions. Thank you, Prof Professor Nogales, for that wonderful talk. We do have um, a few questions here already. Um, one was, uh, was the 3 DVA tool used on the nucleosome to test flexibility? The 3D, the 3D flex? So we, we could see that the complex was very flexible. This is reflected in the fact that we cannot push the resolution because uh, the different elements are not exactly aligned always one with respect to each other. Uh, we use 3D flex both as a way to describe the, the, the kind of motions that are present, but also to try to push the resolution of the different elements that are moving with respect to each other. And that was the thing that worked the best for us, pushing the resolution and allowing us to generate models that had this, you know, the, that gave us biological insight. Thank you. Uh, before I uh, pose the next uh, couple of questions, I want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please put them um, in the Q&A. Okay. Um, can you talk about the practical challenges of solving structures that are similar and in equ equilibrium with each other? Right. Yeah. So, so you're correct that if they are in equilibrium, but one is very different from the other, um, very simple uh, 2D or um, 3D, but even 2D classification scheme could separate them very early on uh, in the data processing scheme. When uh, when the differences are smaller, uh, they may still be detectable by regions in the complex that appear more blurry or that appear to have weaker density because they are present in substratecheometric amounts. Uh, and in that case, we need you know, nested cycles of mm, uh, 2D and 3D variance analysis. In some cases, we need to do focus classification without alignment because those elements may be so small. Um, we, mm, we may even have to do something that is called signal substruction, where the more the common part is that reaches high resolution is eliminated, actually computation eliminated from the image so that we concentrate on the variable regions um, and, and discriminate among them um, at that stage. So there are a number of pathways that we can follow during the data analysis that can deal with differences larger or smaller in our structures. Okay, that actually um, segues uh, perfectly to the next question, which is what kind of artifacts do you see in these images that make it hard to accurately study their structures? I hate the word artifact, but one, one thing that we do see, and this is why we established the use of the streptabinin monolayer for all our studies of PRC2 so far, and this everybody sees, and you see it to different extent depending on your particular sample. So the one major bottleneck in cryoEM is, is sample preparation. It's going from your protein purified and in the test tube to have it now in a thin layer of vitrified water that you can put in the electron microscope and image. 
So the process of both uh, the, of thinning the sample just before the vitrification occurs and to do it so that your sample is not damaged, you get the right thickness, you get multiple uh, orientations, hopefully random, so that you can see your molecule in of use. That is tricky. And one major problem has to do with the fact that the air-water interface so to start with, the protein is in a big volume exposed to very little surface. But when you put it on an AM grid and you blot it, and at the end, you have thicknesses that are of the order of the size of your molecule, the molecule is exposed a lot to air-water interfaces. Air-water interfaces are huge hydrophobic sinks. They're hydrophobic surfaces. And proteins tend to, um, you know, move between folded and unfolding uh, unfolded states in which they expose hydrophobic surfaces or they can have exposed hydrophobic surfaces by nature because they would bind a ligand that you don't have present in your structure and things like that. In any case, the interaction of proteins um, through these hydrophobic uh, um, exposed areas with the air water interface can really damage them. It could, it could um, give rise to you know, um, partial or total unfolding, aggregation, things like that. So this is something that we should take care of. So what happens is that when any of these things occur, there is a, what we generate is what we call bad particles mm -hmm. that we eliminate. How do we eliminate it? Because at the end, all of the, um, the analysis is based on averaging, um, putting together, images that are self-consistent. Now, all the particles, the, the particles that are healthy, they will be self-consistent, maybe not in a single class, maybe in two or three. The ones that are damaged, each one of them is damaged in a different way. They're, they're unfolded. So those give rise to inconsistent, low resolution kind of blobby um, particles that you eliminate. I think what we see through averaging is what is, mm, is preserved and is unique to the molecule. And if we do see it, it is there. It may be that if we don't see it, <laughs> it's because we have not captured it. But what we see, I would never, I would not think that is an artifact. Furthermore, when we get to resolutions better than for Angstrom, we can feed atomic models. We can see side chains. So we need that that's real. We know that that's real. That's my answer. Long, but thank you so much, Dr. Nogales. Um... I, I, I'm going to take the last question. Uh, I, I'm not a structural biologist. Uh, my interests in, in research are more on the translational side. So this, this question is going to come from that perspective. What, what implications does this have in understanding uh, um, disease and, uh, and health? Yeah, excellent question. So um, I like to talk about two, well, first, generally, I think that if we understand that disease is a situation in the organism down to the cell, down to individual misbehavior of key cellular components, it is obvious that the more we learn about these components and the way they normally act, the better we'll be able to understand when they are misbehaving. One obvious thing that we get through uh, getting atomic structures of these uh, cellular components is that we can place in them um, missess mutations, so mutations that happen that give rise to a change in amino acid that can therefore have an effect on the structure and the dynamics of the protein. So we can place them, and by seeing where they go uh, in the context of our functional studies, we can understand better the principles of those hereditary uh, diseases um, that occur or, um, or aspira, you know, mutations that happen in cancer during, during adulthood. But obviously the most interesting thing is that most therapeutics you, um, act um, small molecules that act by binding to pockets in the surface mm -hmm. of proteins and altering how they function. And both, um, you know, um, the design, but also most especially the improvement of drugs come from being able to see how these pharmacotherapeutic agents are binding to the protein, what they're doing, how farther chemical glues could be added to gain more grab 
onto onto the protein. So these these are tools of the of the trade that pharmaceutical biotech companies use all the time. For many years, this was dominated by X-ray crystallography, but now it has really exploded with uh, with uh, cryempt because apart from anything else, most targets of therapeutics are integral membrane proteins that are extremely difficult to uh, to purify in large amounts and crystallize, but that are now much more readily available through cryoelectron microchip. That's amazing. Uh, once again, Professor Nogales, thank you so much for such a fascinating talk. And thank you for um, being a part of this this day with us. Um, I'm well, going to turn it back over well, to- Congratulations again to you guys and uh, for doing such an excellent job putting this together and getting so many people uh, to participate. It's, it's just fantastic to see. Thank you. I'm Louisa. I'm uh, this year's MSA Student Council past president. So this is my last year serving on student council. Uh, and I'm currently a postdoc um, in France. So oh. um, I don't want to uh, take up too much more time. I'd like to get to our first speaker. Um, Catherine Miller is a research scientist at Stanford University. And her talk uh, is titled Novel Some Membranous Pro Protein Detection Method Sub Immunogold SEM Localizes the Mechanosensitive Channels of Auditory Sensory Cells with Nanometric Precision. Uh, Dr. Miller, take it away. I think you're still muted. <laughs> Thank you so okay. much for the opportunity to, um, to present today. Um, I'm Catherine Miller. I am a research scientist uh, at Stanford University in the Department of Otolaryngology, where I study hearing loss. Um, <clears throat> and today I'm really excited to get to present to you um, a new technique that we have developed for um, looking at the submembranous proteins um, using um, scanning electron microscopy. And specifically, we used this um, to look at the auditory system. So I'll try to give a little bit of an overview of, um, of what our specific work is like. Um, so <clears throat> as, as many of you will already know, membrane specializations are structurally and functionally distinct. So cells have all of these different parts of the membrane sort of pulling off in different ways. So you can imagine if you're looking at the intestinal villi, or if you're looking at tracheal cilia, or if you're looking at um, what I study, which is the um, the, <clears throat> the inner ear hair cell stereo. Um, so um, in the inner ear uh, stereocilia, which are um, important for um, taking the mechanical stimuli um, of um, sound waves and um, transducing them into um, the impulses that are sent to the brain. And the, and the way that this works, um, if you focus in on these cochlear hair bundles and you imagine um, slicing directly through the center of them um, and looking at them um, in this sideways view where you see this staircase arrangement, um, the tall, medium, and short rows of these stereocilia that are connected by the tip links. When um, waves generated by sound um, pass through the cochlea, they deflect these hair bundles tension is put on the tip links, the channel which is located at the bottom of the tip links opens, ions flow in, um, this depolarizes the cell and um, information is sent to the brain um, with frequency, frequency specificity. Um, if we focus in on this area around the tip links, you can see that um, there is really a localized protein expression. So lots of different proteins that are expressed at the top of the tip links. The tip links themselves are unique proteins and um, many, many proteins down at the bottom, including um, TMC1, which is the putative uh, channel protein um, that is important for allowing this influx of ions and allowing hearing to, to function. Um, <clears throat> and so um, what we have wanted to look at um, is where are all of these proteins localized, as many biologists do. Many of you already know this, um, that proteins can be localized using antibody labeling. So using a primary antibody that is specific against a protein 
um, you can then use, um, in most cases, a fluorescently, uh, fluorescently conjugated secondary antibody to target um, that primary antibody. And when you um, look at it using um, a fluorescence microscopy, confocal microscopy, um, you can see, um, in, in this case, we were targeting the protein ESPIN1, which sits at the tips of, um, it's an actin bundling protein, um, so phylloidin staining the actin filaments of our stereocilia, and ESPIN1 sitting at the top um, labeled in green. So this is a very common way of localizing proteins. However, um, what happens is that there is a restriction of resolution. So for instance, if we look at the tip link, which I showed earlier, using fluorescence microscopy, this is kind of the best resolution that you can get is labeling one of the tip link proteins, Cadherin 23. And you can kind of guess where the tip link is. If you want higher resolution, you need to look using electron microscopy. So um, transmission electron microscopy can show you the tip link um, in between the stereocilia here, or scanning electron microscopy, which, um, which gives a, a, a more structural data um, of the tip link as well. So uh, is it possible to achieve nanometric resolution of a specific protein's localization? And the answer is yes. So this is through immunogold electron microscopy. So instead of using the fluorescent dye conjugated secondary antibody that you would for fluorescence microscopy, instead we use a secondary antibody conjugated uh, to gold beads. And the, using these gold beads, um, the backscatter electrons um, can be resolved um, uh, in, in uh, electron microscopy. So this can be paired with um, immunogold, uh, immunogold TEM, so slicing through your sample and looking um, internally. However, getting the correct slice um, is very time consuming, and this can end up um, really restricting the number of samples that you're able to produce. Um, or it can be done using immunogold SEM. However, up until now, only extracellular epitopes have been able to be detected by immunogold SEM. Um, and um, we found that this is um, really needed to be able to see um, inter internal epitopes. And so we generated this new protocol that allows us to look at submembranous epitopes, which we have dubbed sub-immunogold SEM. Um, and this is um, in review currently at Nature Communications. So to give some examples of what this might look like, um, in our stereocilia, we first um, looked at a calcium pump, PMCA2, which is strongly expressed. You can see here um, uh, in the magenta labeling, we have very strong labeling of PMCA2 um, in our uh, stereocilia. And when we look using sub-immunogold SEM, you can see that we have um, lots of gold beads along the lengths of all of these stereocilia. And Outside of just the nanometric resolution of this, we are able to quantify specifically um, the numbers of gold beads that are found and where they are found. So the distribution uh, along the stereocilia length, this is really where the strength of this technique shines. So you can see here that um, we could measure the distance along the length of the stereocilia for each of these gold beads, um, which is targeting an epitope. And in this case, we uh, quantified um, for, um, all of the different conditions, which I'm only showing um, one here, between 580 and 2,204 beads quantified between eight and 28 stereocilia. So you can really um, generate uh, quite a large amount of work. Um, looking at another protein, this is an actin bundling protein called EPS8. So you can see by fluorescence microscopy that it sits at the tips of the stereocilia. And here you can see um, the, the very specific epitopes being labeled by our 10 nanometer gold beads. Um, double labeling is also possible using different size gold beads. So in this case, our PMCA2, which I showed first, is labeled in five nanometer beads, um, which in the zoomed in version are labeled by triangles. And EPS8, which was the second that I showed you, is labeled by arrows using 10 nanometer gold beads. Um, and very importantly, um, subimmunogold SEM reveals differences that are not visible by fluorescence microscopy. So here you see two images. And by eye, they look relatively similar. These shorter stereocilia rows have magenta labeling at the tips. Um, so there's a protein that's being expressed um, at the tips of these two different rows. But these are two very different proteins. One is our channel protein, TMC1, and the other is a myosin, myosin 15A, long isoform. And I will show you now what those look like when we visualize them using subimmunogold SEM. 
Um, for TMC1, when we zoom in at the tips of the stereocilia, you can see that we have these single uh, gold bead labels sitting at the tips of these transducing stereociliary rows. However, when we look at myosin 15A long isoform, we see instead these rings that sit right at the tips of these transducing rows. So they are forming a ring around the area where the channel is located, where the tip link would insert. This is something that is completely not visible using confocal microscopy. And these rings are also quantifiable. We quantified them by diameter. So looking at the diameter of the rings in the row two versus row three stereocilia, it's quantifiable by distance to the tips uh, of the transducing stereocilia. So you can start to see how, um, how nice this resolution is. So 40 nanometers from the tips of the transducing stereocilia um, and the huge numbers of quantification that is possible. And also we were able to show that this ring is refined um, developmentally. So at P11, uh, there's no ring. By P13, the ring is starting to form in some of the stereocilia and by P24, uh, 24 days um, postnatal, um, that, that the ring um, is, is uh, well formed at the tips of these transducing stereocilia. And again, this is quantifiable. Um, very quickly, I just wanted to show that this is viable in other systems. Um, we also uh, performed this labeling using the tracheal epithelia, looking at the ACE2 receptor, which is the receptor for the COVID-19 uh, virus, um, SARS-CoV-2. And um, we found that there is very specific localization of um, this receptor along the lengths um, of the tracheal ciliated cells. Um, so the distance from the ciliary tip, we were able to quantify and showed for the first time that this receptor is located at very specific distances. Um, and finally, for those of you who um, are looking at um, Cree recombination, um, if you're looking for cells that have been Cree recombined, um, this also is able to um, find the cells uh, based off of um, the uh, apical surface expression of um, uh, an, uh, um, TD tomato in this case under Cree promotion. So you would be able to localize um, specific cells without having to go back um, and find them um, on your own. Um, and with that, I'd really like to thank the members of the lab that I work in, particularly um, Professor Nicholas Grier and Pei Wang, who um, helped me a lot, a lot with this project, all of our collaborators, um, the Department of Otolaryngology and their funding, and you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Melios. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, we already have a question in the chat. Uh, is there something about the stereocilia or cilia plasma membrane that makes some sub-membrane labeling possible using low-dose triton, or is your approach possible through the regular plasma membrane surface of a cultured cell? That's a great question. Um, we haven't tried it with cultured cells, but because um, we are able to see labeling through the apical surface, um, of the of this uh, of the cells that we look at, I, I don't see why this wouldn't be possible. Um, there is more than just low dose Triton that's important um, in order to get the labeling to function properly. Um, and we talk about um, the full protocol in the paper, um, which is up on Research Square. There's a, a preprint available if you're interested in the technique. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, if there are any more questions, please put them in the chat for Dr. Miller, but for the sake of time, I'd like to move on to our next speaker. Uh, we have Teresa Wiesner, who is a uh, postdoctoral researcher um, in the uh, Neurophysiopathology Institute in uh, Marseille, France. The uh, title of her talk is Role of the Membrane-Associated Periodic Scaffold in Regulating Exocytosis Along the Axon. Dr. Wiesner, um, I'll let you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction, Luisa, and thank you very much to the organizers for allowing me to present my postdoctoral work here. And I've seen that uh, we're really coming from very different fields. So I would like to start my presentation with a very simple question. Okay, which is why doesn't the sea sponge remember anything? And indeed, if you think about it, it's because the sea sponge doesn't have a brain, it has no neurons to process information. 
So neurons are receiving information via dendrites, and then they can process this information at the soma and send the process signal to other neurons via the axonal compartment. And this functional compartmentalization is supported by the polarity, so this uh, more really particular morphology of the neurons. And so to be highly polar like that, there is a membrane periodic scaffold under the plasma membrane. This is supporting it. And it's composed of actin rings interleaved by spectrum tetramers at a distance of about 190 nanometers, which is, of course, uh, under the diffraction limit of conventional fluorescence microscopy. So to study this, you can use uh, fluorescence super resolution microscopy. And here I'm showing you an example of structured illumination microscopy. Uh, where I revealed uh, the alpha 2 spectrum and beta 4 spectrum tetramers in dissociated hypocampal cultures using immune staining. And I hope you can appreciate the very periodic and highly organized uh, organization of these tetramers. And while we looked at this, we realized that this organization, the me uh, membrane periodic scaffold, stops at presynaptic sites, the sites of interchanging communication between different neurons. Where there we can have vesicular release to release uh, neurotransmitters to the next neuron. And so what we hypothesized is that maybe additionally to uh, being a supporter of the physical and morphological organization of the neuron, maybe the membrane periodic uh, scaffold is also building an insulating layer under the plasma membrane preventing spurious uh, exocytosis of vesicles outside of the presynaptic butons. So to address these questions, I aimed to map exocytosis along the axonal compartment and then to link the scaffold organization to the patterns of exocytosis. And in the long run, I would like to reveal the nanoscale relationship between the scaffold organization and the sites of exocytosis. So to start things first, to really uh, identify exocytosis along axonal compartments, I'm introducing VAMP fluorin. VAMP is a marker of exocytosis tagged to a pH-sensitive uh, uh, GFP variant, fluorin. And as you might probably not know, but interestingly, vesicles are very acidic inside and so the fluorin is quenched when it is facing inside however when we have exocytosis fluorin will then face the extracellular manure which is neutral and then of course fluorescent so here we have two examples on the left hand side we have exocytosis um, where here the exocytosis event is spreading out on the axonal compartment and on the right hand side we have a very tightly, spatially confined exocytosis event, which you just see as a small little bit. So by introducing the warm fluorin into neurons, I can observe the soma, the dendrites, and also the axons that you see here as thin, uh, very small, thin uh, filaments in the image. And then we can take a video of this living neuron, and hopefully you will be able to see some exocytosis in the dendritic compartments and also maybe in the axons, and not only vesicles that are being transported along the axon. It's a little bit difficult to see, I have a trained eye, but to highlight um, then where we have exocytosis in the synapses or in the axons, we also added in our lifestyle imaging condition a marker of active synapses. And this allows us then not only to show that there's exocytosis on dendrites, but also on different axonal regions. And in this particular case, we were able to show that there is exocytosis on the axonal shaft, so not at the presynaptic buttocks. And so when I quantified the number of exocytosis event per square micrometer, uh, I observed that the majority of exocytosis events occurs on dendrites and soma, but we have uh, also axonal exocytosis. And this axonal exocytosis is mainly supported by exocytosis occurring on synapses with a very, very small contribution of exocytosis occurring on the axonal shaft. So I then wondered uh, that what if I remove one of the periodic scaffold proteins, such as actin or spectrin, 
would I see a different exocytosis pattern on the axon? So I attacked actin by using a pharmacological drug called swinolite, which severs basically actin filaments. And here, what you see on the left-hand side is my transfected neuron with the warm florin uh, label in cyan. And then I used immunohistochemistry to reveal the underlying F-actin structure and used, again, structured illumination microscopy. And on the right-hand side, you can see that the axon that was transfected is showing the periodic structure of the actin. However, when I incubated neurons with the spinolite, we see a reduction in the intensity of the F-actin signal, and also we lose this really highly paradized uh, pattern. I subsequently uh, uh, quantified, again, the exocytosis occurring in axon shaft and synapses. And what I could see, this is in neurons that are treated with spinolite, there seems to be a tend to uh, observe more exocytosis, both in the axonal shaft and in the synapses. And in the future, what we would like to do is really to re reveal the relationship between the neuronal physiology and the nano underlying nanoscale architecture by combining the lifestyle imaging with the super resolution microscopy. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank the Neuroscience team, but there's many of you who are now uh, also in the webinar, I know. I would like to thank Christophe, who is also attending the webinar, who is always supporting my work. And I would like to thank our collaborators, especially Ellen from Stephanie Gupton's lab, who helped me to analyze the exocytosis events in our videos and who just had out a preprint. So if you're interested, please don't hesitate to look into it. And I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Wiesner. Um, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. If you would rather uh, remain an anonymous, you can send them to me directly and I'll post them here. Um, I will start with, uh, with a question regarding the exocytosis events you see when the cytoskeleton is intact. The, the events you see outside of the presynapse. What, yes. what could those mean? Well, we could imagine that uh, even in a normal neuron that is not treated with a drug or a genetically modified where you remove the cytoskeleton, that even there, once in a while, you would need exocytosis to occur outside of the synapse because the synapse is very um, tightly organized. So... And it's very, uh, very full compartment, really full of proteins. So if you want to bring in receptors to the membrane, um, that might be very difficult to have exocytosis at the synapse, but it would be maybe better to do it at the perisynaptic site, so outside of the synapse. And then these receptors that get introduced into the membrane could diffuse laterally to the active zones of the synapse. So uh, I think it could really be a, a mechanism to differentiate between different signaling pathways. Okay, um, okay, thank you. Um, one, one other question, can you explain the benefits of structured illumination microscopy over more conventional techniques? Oh, over more conventional techniques. So structured illumination microscopy uh, allows you for one, uh, to have super resolution microscopy in the range up to 120 nanometers. Uh, you can do this over several colors, uh, so you can reveal several proteins of interest uh, and not just one. Uh, I think this is very advantageous. And you can use conventional flow force or dyes as um, in other super resolution microscopy uh, techniques. For example, you do need specialized dyes to actually uh, achieve the super resolution. So I think in this way, uh, structured illumination microscopy is actually very advantageous. Um, I'd like to squeeze in this last yeah. question. What are some of the limitations between merging the live cell and super resolution microscopy data? Um, and how can we push the field forward? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the limitations. <laughs> Well, it's different modalities, and so it's very difficult because you acquire, uh, as you know, Lisa, uh, 
you acquire first the lifestyle imaging on your setup. And then uh, in our case, we would fix the cells and then uh, use a different super resolution microscope and try to really find and identify the cell that you found during the lifestyle imaging. And so that can be very, very challenging. Of course, you also have difficulties because now the cell that you might have found again might be differently oriented or might also be morphologically slightly distorted, I would say. So I think there are several uh, limitations that uh, one has to address. I think it's a long topic. I don't think I can do the, uh, a short answer, sorry. <laughs> That's fair. Um, thank you again, Dr. Wiesner, for your, uh, for your talk. That was really excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Lisa Ishan Wilson. She's a postdoctoral fellow at uh, the Scripps Research Institute. And the title of her talk is Visualizing Some of Nature's Most Mysterious Molecular Machines Using Cryo-EM. Yes, thank you so much for that introduction. And Teresa, that was my question. Your answer was excellent. I just think about this a lot. So I, lo I loved your answer, thank you. <laughs> Let me just share my screen. Okay, amazing. Yes, thank you again for the invitation. I'm really excited to speak today. And uh, really the star of the show today, the focal point is uh, one of nature's most mysterious molecular machines called YME1. So this protein is located on the inner region of the mitochondrial membrane. So mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, they have two membranes. And that becomes really important for how different information is shuttled across the different compartments and how the the things that shouldn't be there or need to be moved are really uh, surveyed and um, shuttled around. So this protein YME1L is really critical for doing that across the inner membrane and the matrix. And so I'll talk today about how cryo-EM, cryo-electron microscopy, has been a really great tool for starting to unpack some of the mechanisms behind this. And so throughout my entire career, there's really been a central thesis that guides me, and that is that form follows function. So structure provides great insight into an enzyme's role within the cell. So I started by looking at the microtubule cytoskeletal protein uh, in the cell and thinking about how post-translational modifications, as well as different uh, proteins, are able to bind the surface and, and, and really drive microtubule regulation. And this was with Dr. Eva Nogales, who we heard from today. And then uh, the, the, this work has also led to collaborations in the viral entry space. And thinking about how we fight disease has been a very exciting time to use cryoEM to really understand a lot of these mechanisms. But again, the star of today and the focus of today will be on my main postdoctoral work, which is uh, again, YME1, this inner mitochondrial protease that is critical for not only degrading, but doing other functions as well that I'll go into more detail about and has really helped me hammer this thesis home in that studying its structure and all of its different conformations is providing great insight into its deeper roles within the cell. And so mitochondria, as I mentioned before, are the powerhouse of the cell and they're double membraned organelles. And so that becomes really important when we think about how they're isolated from the rest of the cell, from the cytosolic uh, quality control mechanisms like the proteasome and ubiquitin tags. Uh, so they have really done an amazing job uh, being able to evolve their own system of quality control proteins uh, within the outer and inner membrane. So they really have this little army working together to maintain quality control and mitochondrial health. And so for my postdoc, what really drew me to the Scripps Research Institute uh, was this work on inner mitochondrial proteases and specifically YME1L. So it's an ATP energy dependent inner mitochondrial protease. It's a hexamer uh, composed of ATPase rings and uh, protease domains. And so it's highly versatile. Not only can it degrade proteins like many of its other protease like um, uh, homo or, uh, yeah, um, homologs, so essentially proteins within its uh, similar family. It can also site-specifically cleave. It can pull apart aggregates. 
and it can also chaperone proteins, but its structure is not that different from other hexameric proteases. So it's doing something else in terms of its conformational flexibility, or you can think of it as like, I, I like to say conformational gymnastics. It's really evolved this way to move that in a way that is unique from its partners. And why I was really interested in this work is around this decision-making. So how do these conformational dynamics affect whether it's going to perform processive degradation or site-specific cleavage? And what which one it does has major implications for um, cell health and mitochondrial health. And we see that, for example, under stress, a high-fat diet, for example, mice were found to die. Um, in cancer, when you have a loss of function mutation, that actually helps with tumor suppression. Um, and then when it's when there are different mutations associated with site-specific cleavage, it's other modality, we see that there are differences in how mitochondria uh, dynamically move. So whether they're fusing together or coming apart. And this can has implications for chemo resistance or malignant progression. So this one protein has been shown to have these really critical roles across both positive and negative functions within the cell. And its structure is similar to these other hexameric proteases. And so that really drew me into this um, project, wondering how, how is it sensing its prey and how is it going ab about this different decision making? And so in 2018, uh, before I joined the lab, um, the Lander Lab at Scripps was able to resolve the um, high resolution details of the catalytic domain of the yeast protein. And so you can see this unfolded protein in orange is now getting pulled into the catalytic um, site or domain. And you can think of this as the, the catalytic chamber where it's starting to chew up the protein. And so highlighted here are um, poor uh, uh, um, different amino acids. So sp specifically tyrosine pore loops is the nickname we've given it. And they nicely intercalate along this backbone and pull it into that chamber. And here is the ring of protease domains at the bottom really chewing that up. And so that was very nice to start to, to understand the mechanisms behind this, where ATP binds, how it regulates and couples ATP hydrolysis to this degradation activity. But there were still open questions how is it selecting and engaging its substrates? And are there other confirmations that must be driving this process, such as substrate recognition, substrate engagement, substrate release? How does this change under stress? Is it tissue specific? How does it change in the eye versus the brain or the heart? How might this change as we age? There are really so many more questions to be addressed. And so that's really where my work comes in. I worked on isolating the protein um, and looking again at the yeast catalytic domain. So the, that ring of ATPases and that ring of proteases and trying to understand if there were other confirmations at play to try to get its full confirmational and functional landscape. So first we used a bacterial expression system to isolate it, freeze it on the grid, which Eva, um, Eva today did a really beautiful job introducing cryo-EM in the process. Uh, then we plunge freeze. It's a very fast process. Use um, a high-end microscope. I specifically use the Arctica. And then we can collect on a very nice detector to start to get 2D images of YME1 really in action. And what I want to highlight here is that it had this really major sort of array of different confirmations that I could see right away. So you could see that this, here's the ring of ATPases, but they're completely open. Here's another example where, again, they're starting to splay open or almost split. So it looks like a stop sign, but then someone split it in half. So almost like this open split hexamer state. And this was already starting to answer the question or address the question, is there an open state? Is there this other secondary state that's essential for uh, sensing and engaging? And so um, in order to start to figure out these different states. I sorted by 2D classes, and this was very subjective. What do I think are the other states? Um, and for me, this was really, I would say, the exciting part because I could start to map out or imagine what its conformational landscape looks like. And I narrowed it down into three parts, the open state, the capture or release state, and then the canonical um, previously published closed state. I would see that already. 
And so using motion-based neural network models, so Eva also introduced this today, which is a program called 3D Flex uh, that was designed by a group called CryoSpark. And what's really important here is we're used to thinking about um, in an individual image for cryoEM that's collected. And so this program, what it does is it will use that image to encode what's called a low dimensional latent coordinate, or you can think of it as like a trajectory of motion. And it'll link that to, or mark it as a specific confirmation per particle per image, feed that into a flow field and combine that with contrast that's generated from the image to give you a really nice 3D map. And so right away, I saw this split Hexmer state that I was hypothesizing exists, where you see the ATPase domains completely split open, no substrate. So it's starting to give uh, it, um, give uh, insight into this pre-substrate engaged state. Then you, here I'm showing the top view. So you're looking at the ATPase domains on, on the top. Then I flipped it so you see the side view. And then I'm showing the bottom where you can see the protease domains also slightly split, which we really weren't expecting because these are very tight knit. So highly, um, uh, uh, highly close interactions holding these protease domains together that are now being split open, uh, potentially from that pool, that allosteric or allosteric pool from the ATPase domains. And so um, in the last few minutes, I just want to show a movie that summarizes our hypothesis. And so we can see that the substrate, our hypothetical substrate that YME1 wants to target and degrade and eat, um, you can see it here in orange. And then it comes close to the uh, to the ATPase domains and to YME1, where close enough so it can start to sense its presence and lock it into place, then nicely position it because we could see not only the open and the close, but I, I haven't showed this, but we saw intermediate states that we could track and that are feeding into this movie. So it positions the prey and then oh. it can just, oh, thank you so much. One minute, yes. Uh, it can really start to make a commitment to destruction. So you can see it lock around and start to completely close and then finally degrade that into, into um, smaller pieces and get rid of it in the cell. And so what's exciting for us, and we're hoping to have this on BioArchive soon, is we can nicely piece together when is YME1 on, when is it off, and uh, what does that mean for its nucleotide state or different proteins that it binds, and get a full picture of how this protein is working, its full functional landscape. Um, and thinking forward, we want to start to think about this in human cells as well and think about substrate specificity, but that's really next steps uh, beyond what I've done uh, in, in my postdoc. And so with that, I love to end and say thank you so much um, to Gabriel Lander, my postdoc advisor, as well as the co-first author on this, on this paper, Christina Puchades, and um, Andrew Ward has be really become a secondary mentor to me as well, and everyone uh, in the community, and again, to all of the organizers today. And with that, I'd love to take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Ishan Wilson. Um, I We do have one question for you. If you can answer in 30 seconds, why do you plunge freeze instead of high pressure freeze? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. High pressure freezing more consistent. Yes, that's a really great question. And high pressure freezing is something I'm hoping to learn actually. Uh, moving forward. But in this case, it was small enough. In 30 seconds, it was small enough to get very nice um, uh, images or get particles suspended in that glass-like ice uh, very, very nicely. So for us, plunge freezing did the job. But high-pressure freezing, especially for the larger complex and thinking about membrane embedded, um, thinking about it in higher order tissues would be great. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. If there are any remaining questions uh, for uh, Dr. Ishan Wilson, please put them in the chat and um, she can answer them directly there. Thank okay, you. last but not least, um, Dr. Yue Yu is a scientist at Chan uh, Zuckerberg Imaging Institute. And uh, her the title of her talk is Advances in 4D STEM Phase Contrast Imaging of Frozen Hydrated Biological Se Specimens. Dr. Yu, take it away. Looking for my unmute button. Always <laughs> for, fine. 
Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yue. I am currently a scientist at Sun Zuckerberg Emerging Institute. And um, thanks for Lisa and also Ava setting up a great you know, um, concept of CryoEM and they showed beautiful work that can be done with CryoEM. So um, um, my talk is related, but switching gear a little bit in terms of um, that I don't have a biological story to tell, but I do have a technique to demo um, in that sense. So, um, right, so this work is a continuation of my PhD work that has done at Cornell. Um, um, mainly, um, again, I'll show more like demonstrations of um, two different face contrast or face retrieval techniques that is applied to CryoEM type of sample. So um, I, I think we have a mixed uh, um, background of audience. Um, so I will do the introduction and most importantly, I want to um, also, you know, introduce my motive motivation of doing this in this um, intro. So bear with me if you already know most of it. Um, <clears throat> so, so far I would say the, the go-to method people are doing with cryo-EM um, solving biological specimens is um, what we call conventional TEM. And um, here I would like to present on a, a different um, operation uh, technique, which is called a scanning electron, uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy, which is shortened for SDEM. Um, most of time you can have both of these operation modes in one microscope. Um, so the difference is that in this stem operation mode, the electron beam is focused to a probe and then the probe is uh, rest across the sample. And um, very importantly, the signals are collected in the diffraction plane instead of imaging plane compared to conventional TEM. Um, so one thing I would like to uh, point out and get this idea across is that uh, very specifically in terms of face contrast imaging or face information, my personal uh, opinion is that STEM was not chosen to be the technique and the, the results kind of speak for themselves. Right now, like I would say 90% of the work that want to get the face information of a biological sample, people will choose to do conventional TEM. And here's the reason, I think, here's the reason, is conventionally STEM detection has a very poor detection efficiency if you want to get face contrast information or face information in general. And that stopped most of people from doing this on biological sample because electrons are so precious in this scenario where we want to um, radiate damage our sample as least as possible. So I see this is why that stem kind of was dropped out from um, 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 in terms of using stem to solve for biological structures face information. Um, but very recently, I would say in two to five, in the recent like two to five years, um, there is a generation, like there is a, a, an advancement in STEMS detector that's happening right now is um, instead of collecting only one or two channels of information in your diffraction plane, what people can now do is to collect the entire information in a diffraction plane. So that radically changes how people can collect data and how the um, and how efficiently you can collect your data now. So with that being said, um, my personal um, so sorry, this isn't like video demonstration of what kind of data you will be collecting. So again, you'll be collecting um, the entire diffraction plane's information if you want to. Um, so in my opinion, the, the fundamental reason why uh, STEM is not the choice for face contrast imaging, I think it is, the, is not there anymore because the collection efficiency right now, I would say is actually higher if you use 4D STEM um, as opposed to uh, conventional TEM. So um, I would cover two techniques in this presentation. One is um, less, less well-known than the other. So the first one is called TCBF stem or parallax. 
And I will point you to a couple of print prints or, or uh, conference abstracts for the details of the mechanism of, of the method. And then I'll also cover one demonstration of tychography. Um, this technique is much well known than the other. And I do would like to point out that there is a very recent preprint that showing um, so far the uh, most advanced results with tychography on cryo EM type of sample. So, like I said, I'm skipping the details of the technique, so I'll just go directly into the results or what more like the demonstration of the technique. Um, this is the result of uh, TCBF stem, which is also known as Parallax. I do want to point out this was the um, work led by my PhD PI, Lino Cocordes at Cornell University. Um, so what you are seeing here is a side-to-side -side comparison of two techniques. One is, like I said, I would think it's the go-to method that people do now, which is um, energy filter TEM. And then side by side, you're seeing TCBF stem. And I'm demonstrating this on a relatively thick sample. This is an entire E. coli um, cell, as you can see here. And um, hopefully um, you can um, get a, a sense that in especially the thicker area, TCBF stem is revealing more details than um, energy filter TEM. And we attribute this to the collection efficiency collection efficiency of um, the two techniques because um, with the same amount of incident dose, we observe only 11% of electrons um, present in the the AFTEM case, whereas there are 41% of electrons that can be used in the uh, TCBF STEM case. And um, again, that has to do with um, in TEM, energy filter TEM, for the people who know about it, you do have to apply an energy filter, especially if you're looking at thick sample, to throw away the inelastically scattered signal. Um, so we attribute this um, um, kind of improvement that we are seeing to a better um, um, dose efficiency of this technique. And then um, to show more examples coming along. Um, oh, speaking of mitochondria, this is- Dr. Um, sorry, uh, yes. Two more minutes. Oh, okay, so this is an image of mitochondria and I would just like to point out that um, we, um, the difference you can see in terms of the inner double layer membrane of this mitochondria. And one more example of um, another uh, big thick uh, vesicles and some more examples of, um, of E. coli that um, in the, again, in the thick area, that's what we observe the advantages. So this technique itself, I think, is ready to look at the systems where they're, um, where, where they're thick or dense uh, for ultrastructure kind of information. And I do would like to point out that in terms of high resolution information, we're also testing out this technique on thin sample. And so far, uh, me and my collaborator are observing a kind of um, um, uh, information transfer up to seven angstrom, which is not as good as how normally TEM can do, but we're trying to um, look around and see where actually is limiting factor is. So with that being said, I would like to summarize that um, for the stem in general, we see an, um, a, a hope of more a higher collection efficiency in terms of signal. So, so far I have demonstrated that we, we think we observe an advantage on thick sample, and we're also pushing on a high resolution on thin sample as well. And with that, I would like to thank a lot of my collaborators in Cornell University, here at St. Zuckerberg Imaging Institute and my collaborator at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And um, I can take questions if I have time. Thank you, Dr. Yu. Um, let's see if there are any questions in the chat. Uh, okay. So uh, um, this is from... Um, Lisa, Ishan Wilson, such a beautiful talk, UA. So nice to see you again. 7A is amazing progress. What was the process like to prepare mitochondria on the grid for 4D stem data collection? Um, do you have to add fiducials? And when you say thick samples, do you mean ice thickness? And how thick should the ice be? 
So uh, when I say thick sample, it's it's a sample itself. It's thick. For example, you're seeing the entire mitochondria. Um, these samples I'm showing really roughly measurement overall. It's about like 600 nanometer to 900 nanometer. For this one, the sample preparation is actually also plunge and freeze. And um, it's a whole another different story in terms of how we get the mitochondria isolated on grids. Um, so probably don't have time to go there. And there is no fiducial added. Um, Okay. Thank you uh, to all four of our speakers. Uh, we'll now get started with the research talks portion of the conference. We're lucky to have a mixture of postdocs and graduate students giving talks today. Uh, each speaker will have about 15 minutes for their presentation. If speakers, you could please leave uh, two to three minutes after your talks for questions. And then if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat as we move along, and then we'll have time for them after the talks. So our first speaker today is Jerry Marie Beckfold from Trinity College in Dublin. If you'd like to go ahead and uh, pull up your slides. Thank you. Um, and uh, happy International Women's Day, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Julie Marie Beckfold, and I'm currently a PhD student in Trinity College Dublin, um, but what I want to talk to you about today is some work that I did at NCNU during my master's uh, on accessible magnetic characterization of nanomagnet arrays. But uh, before I get into the microscopy part, I want to introduce those unfamiliar to a type of material called artificial spin ice. So bulk magnets are typically multi-domain but when we scale a magnet down to the nano size, there is no longer any room for domain formation. So a nano size magnet is typically single domain. And an array of such single domain magnets is what we call an artificial spin ice. Uh, and these artificial spin ices are heavily researched for use cases in spintronics and magnetricity. But they're typically studied using either synchrotron based techniques like X ray magnetic circular dichroism or quite slow scanning techniques like magnetic force microscopy. So, what my master's supervisor and I thought was why don't we just stick these in the TEM and study them there instead? So, in scanning transmission electron microscopy, we use magnetic fields to control the electron beam. And quite importantly for this work is that we place our sample right here in the middle of the magnetic field from the objective lens. Uh, and that is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, firstly, we, um, the magnetic field from the objective lens uh, when it's on is very strong. So in order to see any of the intrinsic magnetic field of our sample, we need to switch the objective lens off. But even in this off state, there's still a remnant field of about 30 millitesla. Um, but we can use that field for uh, in situ experiments. And I will get back to that later in the presentation. But we also need a technique for seeing the magnetic field inside our sample. And for that, we can use the differential phase contrast technique. So the electron beam is deflected by magnetic fields in the sample. And we can observe this as a shift in the center of mass of the intensity of the transmitted beam. And this is typically done using pixelated or segmented detectors. But what if you have neither of those? Can you still do DPC? And as it turns out, yes, you can. Uh, you can use the ADF detector and by deliberately deflecting the beam onto an edge of the ADF detector using the uh, PLA or diffraction shift, you can translate the magnetic deflection of the beam into intensity variations in a kind of pseudo bright field image. And what we see then after D-scan correction is this from what I like to call the west edge of the detector. And in order to elucidate a vector field, we would need at least one perpendicular direction to this. So I opted for all four and called them the west, east, north, and south edges of the detector. Um, and what you can see is that the opposing detector edges kind of have a, a opposite 
contrast inside the magnets due to the magnetic um, field inside them. And having four images like this allow us to calculate the DPC-X and the DPC-Y signals um, by subtracting opposing detector edges in this case, similar to how a annular four segment to detector, we would subtract opposing detector segments. And then we can combine the DPC-X and DPC-Y to produce this color image that we typically associate with DPC. Of course, this looks really uh, great, but in order to confirm that we would uh, get the same from a, a center of mass uh, analysis of a 40 stem data set, I acquired a um, data set with a pixelated detector immediately following one of these ADF uh, data sets. Uh, and was very pleased to see that these are very well in agreement with one another. So this confirms then that magnetic DPC can be done in any STEM capable TEM with an ADF detector, which to the best of my knowledge is pretty much any STEM capable TEM. Not only is this an accessible route to magnetic DPC, but the 40 STEM data set that produced this image on your right here um, is 33 gigabytes, whereas the four images that produce the uh, image on the left have a total size of 68 megabytes. And this lower data set size makes it possible, like practically possible, um, to acquire a series of images for in situ experiments. For example, magnetic reversal experiments. So, Back to the stem column for a second. Uh, since we place our sample here inside the objective lens magnetic field, we can use sample tilt to control the in-plane applied magnetic field because the magnetic field component that is in plane with our sample increases with increasing sample tilt. And we can use this to force magnetic reversal of the magnets in the array. And with the beam deflected to one edge of the ADF detector, uh, this is what we see. So as I tilt the sample, the magnetic field inside individual magnets flip, and we see that as an intensity change inside the magnets in the image. And this video is in real time. So doing this a bit more systematically and acquiring all four images for each tilt. So Acquiring four images, tilt, acquiring four images again, and tilt some more. Um, and then these uh, color images are produced uh, in post processing, and we can um, calculate the overall magnetization of the uh, entire array from each of these images. Um, and doing this for an entire magnetic field sweep of about 50 to 60 different tilts. Uh, and then calculating the collective magnetization of the array for each of these tilts, we can elucidate the hysteretic behavior of this specific magnetic array. So to conclude, this work demonstrates that magnetic stem DPC is possible with the ADF detector so that you can do magnetic stem DPC in pretty much any stem capable TEM and that the objective lens field can be used for in situ experiments with magnetic uh, systems. And this opens the route to studying artificial spin ices and other magnetic systems using uh, STEM DPC. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the people who made this work possible. So my master's supervisor, Magnus Nord, and uh, Jakob Inja, Erik Fulman, and Ida Bravik for helping me with the uh, artificial spin ices and the, all the magnetic stuff. So, uh, and you guys for, for listening. So, thank you. Thank you, Julie, for your great talk. Uh, I want to go ahead and give anyone a chance to ask a question if they have one. Um, I didn't see anything in the chat. But if not, I wanted to ask a curiosity question about specifically why you were looking at these arrays uh, in the microscope. Um, so these arrays uh, we made as kind of model systems for artificial spin ices um, to see if 
this was even possible. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are made by focused ion beam millings to make them uh, conductive uh, enough to view them in the TEM. Um, and we were happy to see that it's actually fairly um, obvious. The magnetic contrast is fairly obvious, even with this uh, method of just deflecting the, the beam onto an edge of the detector. Um, and now with um, microscopes that have uh, aberration correction for uh, low magnification stem, uh, the resolution is, is enhanced and you can do this with actual artificial spin ices um, and smaller and smaller magnets. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, we do have one question. Oh, just if you had this published, if you could put the reference in the chat. Uh, so this work isn't published yet. We submitted it about uh, a month ago um, and waiting for reviews, so. I did have one question uh, that just popped up. So can you comment on the S slash N degradation as you are effectively losing part of your beam? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, yes, we're, we're, we're putting kind of most of the uh, beam onto the detector, uh, but it's kind of a um, weighing uh, where you get the most uh, signal out of the magnetic deflection. So, um, yeah, we're still trying to use kind of as much of the beam as possible. Um, while still maintaining that we get a good um, contrast from the magnetic deflection. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and invite the next speaker to come up. So our next speaker is Dr. Flavi uh, da Cruz Gallo. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Uh, she's from the University of Florida. No problem. Flavia Gallo is okay. <laughs> Let me just pull up this slide here. Okay. So yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to present today a small slice of a massive initiative that we have in our laboratory here at the University of Florida on the development of novel metallic alloys for shape memory applications. So a uh, quick bio, some highlights if you want to connect please scan the QR code. Uh, so a background on shape memory materials. Uh, those materials, they have the unique property to return to their previous shape after being loaded or strained. The thing is, when the material is uh, deformed under a specific temperature, it's called martensite finish temperature, it keeps deformed until it's heated. Upon heating, you the material has the ability to return to this previous to its previous shape. However, if you heat it above the alcanite finish temperature, let me pull up the laser pointer uh, at a higher temperature. If you heat it, it behaves as a super elastic material. So it has the ability to return to its previous shape only by unloading, which is uh, related to this strain induced martensitic phase transformation. The material actually uh, changed, uh, uh, suffer like a, a solid to solid state, state phase transformation. So, because of those unique properties, this class of material has several uh, applications in the industry. But what if we can combine their functional properties with improved mechanical behavior? We ultimately will broaden their applications, right? So metallurgists usually resort to precipitation strengthening of multi-element alloys uh, because it will introduce second phases spread out in the matrix, and those phases will behave as dislocation uh, uh, barriers to, to dislocation motion. So it will improve the resistance of the material and it will prevent the onset of plastic deformation. However, when we are speaking about shape, shape memory alloys, we are talking about introducing a non-transforming uh, second phase into a transforming matrix. 
Uh, so it might introduce it might introduce some strain concentration uh, locations into this matrix, disturb the lattice, and prevent it from it uh, to behave as a shape memory material. Uh, a high density dislocation matrix might uh, undergo plastic deformation through dislocation slip instead of twinning, which is the Martin Martin site phenomenon related to the shape memory effect. Here we can see some uh, uh, calculated and experimental measures, uh, this, uh, strength concentrations, positions around uh, slip states. We can see that this, those interface might become a source of new dislocations. And for shape memory materials, we might uh, end up having some dislocation induced fatigue. So, because of that, in our materials design, we have to aim for coherent nanoscale precipitates, which will strengthen the, ma the matrix and keep it less strained as possible. For our materials design approach, what we did is that we chose the uh, matrix. We chose to work with Nightnow, which is one of the most widely used uh, shape memory alloys in the industry. And we have learned by uh, from some thermal, uh, thermal calculations, thermal uh, dynamic calculations, sorry, that introducing aluminum to these nickel titanium based alloys will, will probably have the precipitation of coherent uh, nanoscale L21 uh, Heusler phase, which is shown here. This, this precipitate has a, a crystal structure pretty similar to the matrix. So it uh, uh, has a lowest lattice misfit and lattice disturbance. Uh, the drawback is that aluminum additions to night now decrease the transformation temperature. Uh, to compensate for that, we chose to add aluminum to our system because it's known from the literature to increase uh, the transformation temperature, as you can see here, and also to promote the precipitation of the Han phase, which is another nanoscale precipitate, however, with different, different precipitation kinetics. So we chose our system. We'll be investigating nickel titanium half new and aluminum system with different uh, half new and aluminum additions in um, substitution to titanium. To investigate that, we are melted in our lab different uh, compositions. Uh, we heat treated these alloys and we also um, assessed the mechanical behavior by Vickers hardness and also compression, which I didn't put here, and the uh, crystallographic uh, characterization and microstructural characterization using SEM and TM. So, yeah, for the focusing on the CM side of the work, uh, just as a recap, precipitate morphology and distribution and strain uh, surrounding them have an impact on the activation energy for magnetic transformation. To investigate that, we need a technique that provides us in that uh, crystallographic information. Here is our TM uh, in the, uh, the setup for the TM in the scanning mode. Uh, we have the HA, uh, the high angle annular dark field detector, which provides us with a chemical sensitive image. We can see the lighter precipitate here is half new rich, which is the heavier element in the in the composition of the alloy. Um, and we can also have uh, high resolution images, which will combine with the selected area diffraction pattern, provides information on the crystallographic orientation and and everything about the crystal structures present in the material. However, if we are using the high resolution HAAGF, we have a limited field of view. And if we want to investigate, as I mentioned before, the combined effect of two types of precipitates and the, their, their relation to their, their, their effects in the matrix and the, behave, the shape memory behavior of the material, we need to investigate a wider field of view. So for that, we resorted to for this stamp. The 4 stem technique is very similar to the stem. However, we, we have to convert the beam to a nanometer size, uh, around two nanometers, and we raster the beam over the sample and collect diffraction, diffraction patterns for each point. 
This gives us a 2D reciprocal space information, which are the diffraction patterns, at its 2D position in the real space, which for, because of that, we have the name for this term. The detector we use it is the MPAD electron microscope, sorry, microscope pixel array detector, which is a detector with a very high read speed and high dynamic range. This allows us to collect a huge amount of data with high quality, very fast. So we use this massive data set to apply analytical methods. As we can see here, we apply data, data processing technique based on machine learning to combine all those diffraction patterns into elements or phase maps and strain mapping, which means that we can read the lattice distortion generated by those precipitations. I'll go over a few of our results, which these ones are published already, but most of our results are yet unpublished. So I will give you just a highlight on that. So focusing on the 15 nickel 25 titanium and 25 hefnium alloy with one to 5% of aluminum addition, we could observe the shape and memory behavior, but only up to 3% of aluminum, which is this one. The super elastic behavior were present in 4 and 5% of aluminum alloys. We see the decrease in transformation temperature by thermal analysis using the DST, and up to a point where the 4 and 5% aluminum uh, alloys, we couldn't even uh, detect transformation temperature above room temperature. Uh, by doing some atom probe tomography, we could see some ISO concentrations of aluminum in the 4% of aluminum and the 5% aluminum alloys. So from that, we can claim that the solubility limit of aluminum in the matrix is 3%. Above that, we start having some GP zones or new precipitates, which we don't know yet because atom probe tomography doesn't give crystallographic information, right? So. We did some TM, classic TM in the bright field mode. We couldn't detect Hoysler phase, either in the, in the diffraction patterns or in imaging mode. So because of that, we had to go further and dig deeper into the analysis. In this slide, I'm going to show just a flow of our characterization technique. We use SEM for quantitative analysis on the age phase, classic TM, as I mentioned, and uh, resorting to STEM in the ADF. Aided by ADF, we could start determining some areas with increased aluminum content. High resolution ADF, again, some diffraction patterns, and the 4D STEM, which led us to a huge database of um, strain concentrations, uh, precipitation relation, we could investigate and understand the onset of the precipitation of Hoysler phase. And also, for example, for the first time, this is the most important result so far, for the first time we could isolate a unique pattern for the Hoysler phase, which, as I told you before, has a crystal structure pretty similar to the matrix. So it's very difficult, as you all know, it's very difficult to uh, get a good contrast, as you can see here, dark matrix and dark Hoysler phase, but we can confirm this is a precipitate by the, the nano beam electron diffraction. So conclusion for this stem is a very promising technique for those types of complex characterization of multiple phases alloys. We could confirm the Hoysler phase presence there. We build strain maps and build the relationships between those precipitates and the matrix. And future work is to doing CDO TM by heating up and seeing at the actual martensitic transformation occurring. It's a very promising material. Thanks for my funding agents, my collaborators, and for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're unfortunately out of time for questions, but I would like to invite you to pose the questions in the chat, and we'll ask uh, Sarah and Lee from MIT to pull up their slides as the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, it looks good. Feel free okay, to get started sure. whenever you're ready. Yeah. Okay. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm I am Sarah Lee from MIT, and thanks for joining my talk. Today, I'm going to talk about in situ electron microscopy of two dimensional and three dimensional structural dynamics of supported metal nanoparticles for catalytic applications in gas environments. It is not surprising that there is a growing interest in technologies for sustainable future. And improving the performance of functional materials for sustainable technology is critical. Nanosized catalysts are the core components of sustainable technologies, including fuel cell catalytic converter that converts harmful emission gases and CO2 capture and conversion. Catalysts, which are usually metal supported on ceramics or carbon materials, go through dynamic changes during operation. These dynamic changes include structural, chemical, and physical changes of materials, and the changes often lead to performance decay. Famous examples shown here are Oswald ripening and migration and coalescence, which leads to sintering of the nanoparticles. And sintering reduces the surface area of the catalyst and decreases the activity. Therefore, real-time in situ study of the catalyst material is required to provide insights into the deactivation mechanism and design catalysts with long lifetime and performance. For the study of dynamics of nanomaterials, in situ TDM is one of the most powerful tools. Especially to study catalytic reactions in gas phase, TDM with control and gas exposure is useful. Environmental TDM, or in short, ETEM in particular, enables imaging with high resolution under environment control by gas and temperature. And it probes the degradation of catalytic nanoparticles, including sintering that has been mentioned in the previous slide. It also probes the support nanoparticle interaction, which is also known to actively affect the catalytic performance. Moreover, due to the three-dimensional nature of supporting materials and how nanoparticles are embedded, there has been attempts to understand the morphology of nanoparticle on support in three dimension. These studies have shown that 3D imaging can provide additional information on the particle dynamics relative to the support. Therefore, it can be useful for gaining insight into the degradation mechanisms of supported nanoparticles. With this in mind, the objective of this project was real-time observation of structural dynamics of nanoparticles in different gas environments using in situ TM. And the approach was using the combination of simultaneously acquired head of stem image for 2D projection and secondary electron images, or in short, SEM for 3D topography. We use platinum on carbon support as a model system, which is a famous catalyst for proton exchange membrane fuel cell used in high duty electric vehicles. Accordingly, gases related to the fuel cell operating conditions, including oxygen, water vapor, and hydrogen, were used with temperature control. This is the representative example of the video we get from the experiment showing the bright fuel stem, dark fuel stem, and SEM image acquired simultaneously. We first tested in the oxygen environment. In oxygen environment, the onset temperature of the dynamics of the particle was the lowest among all of the gas environments that were tested. This aligns with the previous studies reporting the strongest interaction between oxygen gas molecule and platinum nanoparticle being the driving force for the dynamic migration. And the particle migration of coalescence, or in, in short PMC, occur within few tens of seconds, as you can see from the particles indicated by the arrows in the boxes. First, they migrate, coalesce, and repeat the process. However, more striking results were also found using secondary electron images. First, secondary electron images show that particle migration takes place not only across the support, but through the support. In the box region of these images, particles are not shown in the secondary electron images before one minute, but dark field image shows that they are going through PMC. After initial PMC, the particles approaches to the support and move across the support. Moreover, trench formation along the migrating platinum nanoparticles were also captured, and we attribute this to the carbon corrosion in oxygen environment. 
These results suggest that dynamic features can be captured by 3D imaging, which wouldn't have been possible by only using two-dimensional projection image. In water vapor environment, there was also PMC taking place. However, the onset temperature was slightly higher than that of oxygen, which could be attributed to the weaker interaction between the water vapor and the platinum nanoparticles. But most interesting feature was the oriented attachment. Oriented attachment is rarely captured in gas phase where they rotate to match the orientation of the lattice. And although orientation, although orientation dependent van der Waals interaction is one of the suggested mechanisms, the full process hasn't been fully resolved. We found that there was a previous study theoretically predicting the oriented attachment in water vapor environment. Calculations using DFT and molecular dynamics predicted oriented attachment based on the dynamic, net, di dynamic network of hydrogen bonds between the hydroxyl groups and surface oxygen. On top of being the demonstration of theoretical prediction, this result is important for catalytic applications since hydroxyl group and oxygen play active roles in oxidative cat catalytic reactions. Finally, in the hydrogen environment, the onset temperature was much higher, which could be attributed to the weakest interaction between hydrogen and platinum nanoparticles. After achieving the threshold thermal kinetic energy, due to the higher temperature, faster kinetics of the nanoparticles migration on the surface is taking place. Also, support degradation is taking place along the pathway of nanoparticle migration, which is shown clearly in the secondary electron image video. Although it appears to be similar with the degradation in oxygen environment, since the environment is different, we attribute this degradation to the H2S formation from the sulfur content that already presents in the commercial grade carbon support that we have used in these experiments. And these results show that interaction between gas, support, and particles should be collectively considered when interpreting support degradation. To conclude, first, platinum nanoparticles on carbon support display gas-dependent dynamics here, oxygen, hydrogen, and water vapor, including particle migration and coalescence, important for sintering mechanisms, oriented attachment, and support degradation. And two-dimensional, three-dimensional images provide comprehensive information of the mechanisms and dynamics of platinum nanoparticle degradation under different gas environments. Finally, quantified data from the images can be combined with computational approach, including molecular dynamics that is used to analyze the oriented attachment to provide detailed explanation of particle degradation, including migration and coalescence, support corrosion under each gas condition. With that, I would like to thank our group, Professor Francis Ross Group at MIT and my funding agencies, including MIT Energy Initiative, MIT Mathwork Fellowship, and Bosch Global, and MIT Nano with Itachi, Tim, and um, Aubrey for helping the experiments. And thank you for your kind attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that great talk. We have about a minute for questions. Uh, I don't see any in the chat right now, but I did have just one quick question. If you had uh, happened to try similar experiments, but on different uh, grids, or what do you expect with different supports that it would change your results? Uh, you mean different grids or different supports or both? Uh, both. Okay, so here we have specifically used TM heating chip for the heating experiment, so I'm not sure what grid change would cause. And in terms of support, because support also interacts actively with the particles as shown in these results. And for example, when we use different support with ceramics, they would have different approaches. So for example, here we have seen oxygen and hydroxy hydrogen bond, but when we use say titanium, then they would also effectively involve in proton exchange, proton exchange reaction. So that would cause um, more uh, more classes of interaction shown by using different classes of support materials. I see. Well, thank you very much. Um, we'll go ahead and invite uh, the last speaker. Uh, this is uh, Xin Tong Yun from the University of California, Los Angeles. Hi. 
Hey guys, can you see my screen? Yes, the slides look good. Okay, that's great. Hi everyone, I'm Xin Tong, a fourth year PhD student working with Dr. Yu Zhang Li at UCLA. I'm really excited to be invited and give this talk. The topic I would like to give today is a multifaceted roles of lithium metal in batteries revealed by Coral EM. I will focus on batteries rather than electrocatalysis today. If you are interested in electrocatalysis as well, feel free to reach out and we can discuss later on. Well, let's get started. As we all know that uh, 2017 Nobel Prize in Chemistry has been awarded for cryogenic electron microscopy. That helps researchers to see what biomolecules look like clearly. In particular, there are three main contributions from Corium side to improve imaging quality progressively and significantly contribute to the field of structural biology and microscopy. Actually, in the same year that Corium was awarded to the Nobel Prize, there was another breakthrough in the battery field made by Corium. Before that, imaging how lithium atoms behave in Nanostructure is a long-standing challenge because both lithium metal and uh, organic electrolytes are really IR sensitive and beam sensitive. So if we can rapidly freeze, in, freeze and do all cryo transfer in liquid nitrogen and image at cryogenic temperature, then we can solve all these unstable problems. So cryo EM has the capability to image lithium atoms clearly and help us understand lithium at nano even atomic scale. This was the first development developed by my advisor in graduate school. Well, I suppose most of people's background today is microscopy. So let's have a quick overview on why we want to image lithium. Actually, after decades of development, uh, lithium ion batteries are going to reach theoretical limits. Lithium, but it's far from our current and future energy needs, which motivates a lot of research focused on next generation batteries with high energy density. Lithium metal anode is one of them, since it can provide the promising double energy density, different from graphite anode in lithium ion batteries. Lithium metal anode store energy electrochemically through reversible plating and stripping of lithium ion. So plating morphology can determine the battery cycling performance. Also, we all know lithium metal is really reactive. Almost any available electrolyte will decompose and react with lithium metal to form a current film called the solid electrolyte interface, the screen layer, SEI in short. So the property of SEI can really determine the lithium ion transport during plating and stripping. So take home here, we care about lithium plating morphology and the growth of SEI. Both of them affect the battery cycling performance. In our recent work, we try to decouple lithium deposition from the SEI growth. We found that lithium were deposited into different morphologies in different electrolytes in this normal current density. But at ultra fast current density, all morphology converge to the sharply fast particles. It's interesting, from different morphologies in normal condition to the same morphologies in the same, in, in this ultra fast regime, why can we get fast lithium particles? and ultra fast current density, how to explain it. We came in with a hypothesis that uh, they are wrong back to the hadron. Since lithium is a typical BCC crystal, for a BCC crystal, 110 facet is the most densely packed plane based on warp construction. So here we hypothesize that uh, at ultra fast current density, deposit lithium particles would be reduced faster than electrolyte decomposition. So incoming lithium ions can have a more homogeneous SEF free surface to do fast surface diffusion and form the most 
energetically feelable surface. It makes sense because it happens in all electrolyte we test. But for SEM alone, it's still a weak argument. What we really want to prove is that each facet are indeed 110 for lithium atoms, which is a critical evidence that only chlorium can provide. Here are chlorium images we acquired. We can see all particles are sharply hexagon, which is a 2D projection of Rombeck dodecahedron. Here we show the high resolution image in the left, and the right one is a selected area diffraction from this red box. The six arrows represent the 110 direction of BCC crystal, allow us to assign the crystal facets are all 110 plane. Also, we can zoom in to see the arrangement of lithium atoms by calculating the lattice spacing of 2.48 angstrom, mm -hmm. which is matched the theoretical space spacing of lithium 110. So we demonstrate that um, the facet particles we observed in the SEM are growing along 110 direction and exposing clear 110 facet by crow EM. Above, we show the Rombeck dodecahedron aligned along 111 direction. A hexagon 2D projection is expected. If we image it from different direction, for example, 001 zone axis, a square-like 2D projection is expected. So we can get a similar result that uh, all these four crystal facets grow along 110 and expose 110 plane. Well, then Corral EM provide the critical images for us to prove this is indeed wrong by the hydro. So the take home message today, first we found this facet particles is independent of electrolyte chemistry in ultra fast regime. Second, we review this intrinsic deposition morphology of lithium is wrong by the hydro by leverage Corral EM. Here, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Yu Zhang Li, and the funding support from NSF Career Award and the kind of collaboration from Matt Sonny and all Lithium members, all Lithium group, all group members. Also, I want to thank all organizers for this, for organizing this great conference and the happy International Women's Day. Yeah, that's it for today. I can take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, as the questions kind of roll into the chat, I had one myself. Um, have you found mm -hmm. that having a hexagonal crystal in your SEI is better or worse than a regular SEI in terms of performance after it is formed? Yeah, actually, it's a really good question. It's, a, it's kind of another part in our work. We try to run cycling for performance of this rhombic dodecahedron. Actually, we found that even a show, it, it's a beautiful morphology and a show unif it's very uniform. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, this, this morphology has a bad contact with the current collector. So if we try to strip it, it cannot fully strip it, since the, the, you know, it's a kind of big head, but with uh, small tails. The co connection is not good, but it's kind of a following work we will do in our group to try to strengthen the con connection between lithium and the current collector to, you know, to optimize the cycling performance. Well, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any other questions, but I wanted to inform everyone that uh, at 320, we'll be all be pushed into the main group. Oh, there is one here. It says, how do you rationalize using a full cryo EM prep over using maybe a cooling holder? Uh, oh, why we use cryo EM since we need to do the cryo transfer in the liquid nitrogen actually, since the lithium metal is very air sensitive and moisture sensitive. So we cannot prepare a sample in the air like TEM, like normal TEM. So uh, liquid nitrogen is kind of a good protection to do all cryo transfer from glow box to the TM column. Uh, we have another question that says, have you tried cubic or octahedra shaped nanoparticles instead of rhombohedric, rhombohedric dodecahedra? Yeah, it's a really good question, actually. So, so if we can mo 
manipulate the, the morphology of lithium is indeed a real uh, is indeed a breakthrough. Uh, unfortunately, since now we we only find you know one one O plane is the most energy energetically feasible plane for lithium. So if we want to get a cubic like a one one O O facet or octahedron with for example one 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 facet, it's it will need more. Uh, I feel like so maybe we can apply some uh, agent, uh, cap capping agent to to manipulate manipulate the facet the the plan. But currently, without the SEI influence, one one O is only plan we can get. So it's wrong back to the hydrogen. But it's not. Yeah, it's a good question. We our group is also uh, trying to to manipulate the morphology as well. Exactly. I see. Thank you very much.